So Derez decided to make a video in response to the conversations that I've had with him where he got destroyed. So let's examine this bullshit. So it appears that Derez denies the thesis of cognitive penetration. Cognitive penetration is a massively supported thesis in cognitive psychology and cognitive neuroscience and even philosophy of mind that basically says that our conceptual and intentional capacities influence our phenomenology and perceptions. But this thesis is so demonstrable not only in regard to visual capacities but also all sensorial capacities that it's really absurd to deny. So here's an example of this thesis in action. In Alhamdulillah, Aladi Nahmadu, who won a star in who won a star for who won up Minubi, when a Tawakalu Ali, when I would be him in Shurudi and Fusina, women say ye at the Armalina, when you had the Hilla who fell a mudilla, woman yudlil, fella had yella, when I shadow a la ilaha illa law, wahda who la sherry kala, when I shadow anna Muhammadan Abdullahi or a solo. Now, did you understand what was said? My guess is no, because you're not an Arabic speaker. That is, the cognitive capacities you bring to hearing the sounds coming out of the guy's mouth are different and therefore influence your phenomenology, whether you understand what he said or whether you don't. Now, because Derez denies the role of cognitive phenomenology, he cites a study regarding color agnosia rather than color anomia. Color anomia is the inability to name colors in the absence of a more global anomia associated with an aphasic disorder. The article in study Derez cites makes the distinction between color agnosia and color anomia. Color agnosia can be separated from cerebral achromatopsia, i.e. a selective color perception disorder, it can also be dissociated from color anomia, which refers to a specific problem in naming colors as a result of a lexical impairment. Patients with color anomia are able to point to colors named by an examiner, and associations between colors and specific objects are also intact in color anomia, which is not the case in color agnosia. The website iHuman makes the distinction as well. Color agnosia from the Greek agnosia, ignorance or non-knowledge, is a medical or psychological condition that prevents a person from correctly associating hue names with common objects. The sufferer retains the ability of distinguishing hues. It is a specific form of agnosia and generally results from damage to the visual cortex, often in V4, as opposed to most other kinds of colorblindness, which stem from problems with the photoreceptor cells. Color agnosia is different than color anomia a condition in which a person can distinguish between colors but cannot connect those colors to their names. Failure to investigate color agnosia may lead to late diagnosis of brain cancer. Anomia is a deficit of expressive language. Agnosia is an inability to process sensory information. There is a difference between the two. Therese then mentions a test wherein a patient was able to associate colors in a certain way and that that patient's ability to correctly match the colors proves that there is a perceptual fact of the matter regarding qualia. Well, no it doesn't. As the realistic nihilist points out, all the behavioral dispositions could still be the same. Also, Derez fails to call into question the very conceptual framework of the person who was making the test in the first place, which was most likely the Western imperialistic system of classification. Either way, it doesn't matter because the entire process is physical all the way down. Derez finally puts a bow on the steaming pile of shit he has laid against my position by pointing out that young prelinguistic children have the ability to make certain perceptual distinctions. I covered this in my 90 minute video on consciousness, but I take it he has not watched it in its entirety, so here's what I said. What people like Gopnik and Cool are saying is that the price of perceptual vividness is the inability to make certain perceptual distinctions. Let me explain. 
The vividness and clarity of our representation of reality is mediated by a conceptual structure. This structure necessarily filters out certain things that would be readily apparent to those with a different conceptual structure. However, while babies would be able to make these distinctions, they wouldn't be doing so consciously, as this would result in an information overload. There wouldn't be any conscious signification of perceptual differences. In other words, it's a cognitive trade-off, fundamentally. I will leave you finally with an explanation of this very idea by the great philosophers Michelle Montague and Ray Brazier on this sort of topic. So for the most part, um, contemporary analytic philosophers think that there's only sensory phenomenology, and I'm going to argue today that that is too narrow of a conception of phenomenology. And I do think some of the motivation for restricting phenomenology to this sensory phenomenology is this drive to naturalize, in one of the senses that Dan brought up yesterday, phenomenology in general. Okay? So, with those qualifications, um, a subject who consciously sees a red rose in front of her in normal conditions is having a visual experience as of a red rose. And this conscious visual experience involves certain kinds of phenomenology, color phenomenology, shape phenomenology. And these are, are phenomenological features that we ordinarily associate with vision. And then there are other phenomenological features that we associate with the other sensory modalities. Um, now, conscious seeing is an occurrent process or event which needs to be clearly distinguished from a current but non-conscious mental processing that may take place during vision and indeed may be an essential part of vision. So, for example, when a subject sees a red rose, there's no, do no doubt a lot of non-conscious processing that takes place of the kind that's perhaps postulated by computational theories of vision. Um, you might think that Milner and Goodall have shown that visual information processed in the dorsal stream responsible for the visual control of action is non-conscious. But now consider a subject who is consciously judging that grass is green or consciously comprehending the English sentence that Sarah Palin may be the next U.S. president. I guess I should change that example to Michelle Bachman. No! God, please, no! 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 Unfortunately. Um, just as in the case of seeing, these conscious thoughts need to be distinguished from any non-conscious occurrent mental processing that may take place while having them and may be essential to their occurrence. So, for example, you're comprehending the English sentence about Sarah Palin uh, no doubt involves a lot of non-conscious mental processing that deploys the rules of syntax. So Joe Levine offers one sense, one defla deflationary sense of cognitive phenomenology, um, and he calls it impure cognitive phenomenology. So Levine's impure cognitive phenomenology is the phenomenon of sensory experience being cognitively inflected. The idea is that although all phenomenology is sensory phenomenology, cognitive states can influence the way the sensory manifold is experienced in such a way that two distinct thoughts or conceptual sets result in the same set of sensible features being experienced differently. So, for example, a barn facade looks different to a subject that knows it's a facade. Now, I think that this phenomenon is probably better labeled cognitive penetration. The idea behind cognitive penetration is that beliefs, for example, can affect the way the sensory manifold is experienced. Categories do not represent or designate any apparent feature of the world, they are not phenomenologically intuitable. They cannot be read off the structure of language or of reality. And to assume otherwise is to fall prey to what Sellers calls the myth of the given. And this myth has two forms, epistemic and categorial. The myth of the epistemic given is crystallized in the following inconsistent triad of premises generated by empiricism. And this should be the first um, excerpt on the handout that um, I hope some people have. Um, this inconsistent triad, it's, it's the, the triad which um, uh, empiricism or empiricist philosophers find themselves unwittingly committed to. Um, it's internally contradictory. Premise A is X senses red sense content S entails that X knows non-inferentially that S is red. 
Premise B is that the ability to sense sense contents is unacquired. And premise C is the, the claim that the ability to know facts of the form X is phi is acquired. A and B together entail not C, B and C together entail not A, A and C together entail not B. Sellers' argument may be recapitulated as follows. Knowledge is of facts. To know something is to know a fact or a state of affairs. To know that something is the case. That something is thus and so. Facts have propositional form. X is phi. Either the ability to know facts of the form X is phi is acquired or it is unacquired. If it is acquired, then it cannot be a sensory capacity since, by hypothesis, the ability to sense sense contents is unacquired. This is the premise. Therefore, the ability to know facts must be unacquired. But if it is unacquired, then the world must have propositional form. And this propositional form is mirrored directly by the mind. Since propositional form is, tan is, is tantamount to intelligible order, one must either invoke God to account for the isomorphy between the structure of the world and the structure of mind, or leave it unexplained. So in other words, if this postulate of a pre-established harmony between conceptual order and natural order, that is um, a direct consequence of embracing the myth of the epistemic given. Now Sellers argues that premise A is false. Premise A being the claim that to sense something, to sense a red sense content, means that one, you know, the sensor knows non-inferentially uh, that that sense datum is red or has some, some property. This is the, uh, the claim that must be abandoned, must be jettisoned. Sensing a red sense content does not entail knowing non-inferentially that S is red. In other words, sensory awareness alone does not constitute knowledge. The non-inferential knowledge that X is phi, such as seeing that blood is red or hearing that the clock has struck 12, is a conceptually mediated perception, not a sensible intuition. In other, words, in other words, the point is not to deny that we can know things about the world without making inferences. The claim is that this ability uh, this, to, to engage in a kind of a non-inferential perception is itself mediated by this complex conceptual machinery that underpins uh, you know, sense perception. So the, 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 there's a distinction between sensing and perceiving. Sensing is not knowing. Um, the perceptual immediacy of such knowledge is mediated by an elaborate conceptual framework of objects related in a publicly observable space and time. Moreover, it falls from this account that sensory awareness is not awareness as. To sense something is not to be aware of it as something. It's not to classify it. Um, because to be aware of an item having categorical status F is not to be aware of it as F. To sense something as F would be to, dis to, would be to deploy the concept of F. And such deployment would have to be rule governed. Since Sellers follows Kant in construing uh, con um, concepts as rules for connecting representations. But rule following is thinking, which is an activity irreducible to sensing. So in its most elementary form, the myth of the given consists in conflating thinking with sensing, or in Kantian parlance, concepts with intuitions.